Last time I put a brand new tiny Intel N100 PC against the Raspberry Pi 5, well, there were a lot of strong opinions. The fact is, the Pi 5's base price is pretty much in line with inflation. The original Pi was 35 bucks in 2012, and the Pi 5 starts at 50 bucks today. But the Pi 5 doesn't come with everything you need to run it. You have to buy all the add-ons. And the mini PC runs an Intel CPU, and that's great for compatibility, but almost every one of these N100 systems I've tested performs differently, so you can't apply performance benchmarks and experiences from a high-end N100 PC build to the cheapest tiny PCs like this one. But the one comment I read over and over was it wasn't a fair comparison because I ran Windows on the mini PC and Linux on the Pi. Well, today I have a new version of the GMK Tech Mini PC. It has Intel's newer N150 chip inside, and supposedly that should run circles around the Pi 5, especially if I test them both in Linux. This is the Nookbox G3 Plus. It costs 160 bucks, and this particular unit was sent by GMK Tech after they saw my first video. They didn't pay anything for this video and had no input into what I'm saying though. And the Raspberry Pi and all the stuff I have with it, I bought it. I'll get to a direct comparison, but first we should do a round of myth busting because some things I heard people saying aren't as cut and dry as people think they are. Myth number one, the N100 is more efficient than a Pi 5. This one makes logical sense. The Pi 5 uses a 16 nanometer process node and the Intel uses 10. Better process node, more efficient. Except no benchmark I've run shows this to be true. Intel's gotten better over the past few years, but ARM still holds the crown where efficiency is concerned. Now, that's kind of related to myth number two. The N100 is faster than the Pi 5. Now, this is true for the most part, but just how much depends on a lot of factors. Like on this little PC, which hits its low price point by using older, slower RAM, it's only about 1.5 to two times faster than a Pi 5. Other ARM SBCs around the same price point beat this thing. In fact, they trounce it in most aspects, especially efficiency. So yes, this is faster than a Pi, but we're not talking like Lamborghini versus Snail. Myth number three, tiny PCs are cheaper than a Pi 5. Now here, there's a lot of nuance. To make that statement, you have to qualify it. Are we talking new or used? Are we talking high-end Pi 5, or can you compare the eight or four gig models? Are you adding in shipping or comparing pandemic era pricing to current pricing? Because to make a statement like that, you should be as like for like as possible. And pricing out a 16 gig Pi 5 with 512 gigs of SSD storage, an NVMe hat, a power supply, and a case, then yeah, that's a little over 200 bucks. But let's be honest, I can count on one hand the people I know who are in the market for a 16 gig Pi 5. And you don't have to run a Pi with all the same high-end parts like this. You can get started with a Pi 5 at 60 or 70 bucks all in, assuming you don't need NVMe storage. A Radsa X4 is probably the closest N100 analog, but it's around the same price all in, and it has its own set of compromises. That's not to say it's a bad option. In fact, I have one running in my mini rack. But all I'm saying is you can't say mini PCs are cheaper than Pis without qualifying it. And the biggest qualification leads to myth number four used tiny PCs are cheaper than Pi 5s. And they're, I mean, yeah, used cars are cheaper than new cars. Used game consoles are cheaper than new game consoles. Uh, unless we're talking Nvidia graphics cards or supercars, used is cheaper than new. It's perfectly valid to compare used tiny PCs to new hardware. Y you should do what's best for your budget and your needs, but don't equate used hardware prices to new hardware prices. There are so many reasons why that's not a universal point of comparison, not the least of which is software support and warranties. Finally, one of the least cited myths is that it's easier to plug in things like graphics cards to tiny PCs. Software support wise, I'll grant you that. But most of these tiny PCs have only one NVMe slot and you'd usually use that for a boot SSD. It's at best on par with the Pi 5 for how easy it is to plug in PCI Express devices. The Pi 5 and some other new SBCs have a little PCIe FPC that lets you plug in all kinds of adapters, which is how I'm able to test graphics cards and network cards and things like that on my Pi 5. For this tiny PC, I get more USB bandwidth, sure, but plugging in anything that's not USB can be a little harder. And again, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, it's just different hardware is optimized for different purposes. Maybe it's not fair to compare an SBC that's built for makers and tinkerers to a mini PC at all. I mean, let's be honest, most people that buy Raspberry Pis put them in a drawer anyway. I know I'm a bit out there building servers and GPU rigs with Pis. I don't expect everyone in the market for an SBC to be doing the weird things that I do with them. But getting back to the mini PC, the hardware is actually pretty great. 
GMK Tech does a nice job including a power adapter, an HDMI cable, even a little bracket that lets you mount it on a monitor. The mini PC itself is tiny, and their design just has a plastic panel on top you pop right off. Inside there, you get access to the NVMe slot, a Wi-Fi M.2 slot below it, a RAM slot, and even a spare SATA M.2 slot. And this time, my plan was to do a full apples-to-apples -apples comparison, which means I'm installing Linux on here. I yanked out the included 512 gig AirDisk SSD and installed my own. And then I, I couldn't turn the thing on. After a bit of debugging, I found out the included power adapter was dead. I was only getting 0.14 volts through it, and the adapter itself got a little toasty. So not a great start, but luckily I had my old GMK Tech adapter from last year. So I went ahead and installed Ubuntu. Here's the screen fetch stats for the system, showing everything that's running out of the box. I started running benchmarks, and here you can see when high performance Linpack is running, it used about 25 watts of power from the wall. And here's what the fan sounds like full blast. Honestly, that fan doesn't sound too bad. But when I started trying to use the GPU, I started running into some issues, like the Gravity Mark benchmark wouldn't load. Apparently, Ubuntu 24's kernel has some bug accessing the iGPU on the Intel N150, so to solve that, I had to install the mainline kernel's utility and update to 6.12. That worked, and now apps like GLMark2 and Gravity Mark could use the GPU. I got a Gravity Mark score of about 4,000, which isn't amazing, but at least it's on par with other Intel iGPUs. And GLMark2 scored 2507, about 25% faster than a Pi 5. But when I got back to CPU benchmarking, my results were all over the place. <laughs> the worst thing when you're benchmarking is if you can't get a consistent result. That usually points to something like power or thermals. But before cracking open the case, I checked out the BIOS. I noticed from the factory it was set on the balance power limit, so I went ahead and switched to high performance. That let me get up to 28.5 watts under load, so it was giving me a little more power than before, but the results were still not consistent. So then I remembered from the specs, this box comes with slower DDR4 RAM, probably to save some cost. The N150 can use DDR5, which should be faster, so I ordered a 16 gig DDR5 SODIMM for an extra 45 bucks. When I went to put it in, that's when I realized even SODIMMs like these are physically incompatible. I think they do that because some of the error correction bits on DDR5 make it that way, but I had thought, at least until this point, that that only applied to full desktop dim sticks, not to these tiny SODIMs. But you live and you learn. So I started monitoring the CPU with S2E, which lets me watch clock speeds, temperature, and power draw. And at least during stress and G, it wasn't overheating. But if I ran something more memory heavy, like a 7-zip benchmark, it would overheat. Overheating definitely leads to inconsistent benchmark results because the CPU will throttle to keep it in spec. So my next step was a full teardown and repaste. Getting at the N150 chip is a little more complicated than getting to the stuff on the top side. Besides the top cover, you also have to pop out the white translucent guide which has the Wi-Fi antennas stuck to it. To make sure those don't break, you have to pull out the SSD so you can unclip the antennas from the Wi-Fi card. Then you get access to the mainboard, just be careful pulling it out of the box. Underneath, there's the fan and heatsink. I pulled those off, and when I inspected the factory thermal paste, it seemed okay, but maybe a little dry. To be safe, I cleaned off all the factory paste, and then put on some new Noctua paste. And while I was putting it back together, I noticed the tiny fan connector looks a lot like the one on the Pi 5. So I grabbed my Pi 5 and checked, and yeah, perfect fit. I put the mainboard back in the case, put the plastic shroud on, reconnected the Wi-Fi antennas, and put the NVMe drive back in, and popped the cover back on top. The only thing I don't like about this case design is the reliance on all the plastic clips. It saves cost because you don't need extra metal or screws or assembly time, but like with the M4 Mac Mini, I guarantee some of these plastic bits will break over time. But testing the repaste, the CPU still went past 75 degrees, and I wanted to make sure there was no way it would throttle during my benchmarks. I noticed the top area of the case is basically relying on convection, since there's no fan up there, and that's where the RAM and the SSD are. So I popped off the cover and put a fan right up on top, forcing fresh air down over the back side of the board. And that was finally enough to keep the CPU comfortably below 70, so I could run my benchmarks and compare this thing to a Pi. Really quick, before we get to the comparison, here's the Pi setup I'm testing. There's a Pi 5 16 gig for 120 bucks. Then I have the active cooler, a bumper case, and the 512 gig SSD kit. Putting all this together takes a little longer than the mini PC, but it's definitely a lot more compact. Throwing in Raspberry Pi's power adapter and a clock battery for good measure, and the total cost for this Pi setup is $208, which, yeah, $208 is bigger than $160. So if you're getting less performance at a higher price, then yeah, that's kind of a bad deal. But let's see. And right out of the gate, 
Geekbench paints a pretty bleak picture for the Pi. I mean, it's not terrible, but the mini PC is about 40% faster. But Geekbench is just one benchmark. Moving along to high performance Linpack, I run this to really stress a system, and the mini PC is almost twice as fast on this, though we start exposing the Achilles heel, power draw. It can go twice as fast, but in typical Intel fashion, it uses more than twice as much power. It's not that bad though, and Intel's gotten a lot closer to ARM lately. But to complete the power draw discussion, here are the stats for idle power draw and the maximum. If you have a little server running 24 seven and you don't need double the performance, the Pi saves 10 bucks a year in power draw. Of course, that's in the US where we get power pretty cheap, but over in the EU, that's, well, still only 20 bucks. So the power draw argument isn't that big unless of course you're running off solar or battery power. But moving on, for the integrated graphics, the mini PC is still beating the Pi pretty handily. I couldn't even get Gravity Mark to load on the Pi. Finally, memory bandwidth really shows how the N150 in here is being held back by the slow DDR4 RAM. Some of these cheap mini PCs have DDR5, but usually it means either switching to soldered on RAM chips or switching CPUs. Ultimately though, these little mini PCs are a good value despite the toasty insides. It's obvious they cut a few corners in this design to save money and that leaves performance on the table. And for the Pi, it's less than a hundred bucks all in if you can sacrifice a couple specs. But that's part of my point. If you compare the cheapest new mini PC and the most expensive Pi, you're not really comparing apples to apples, even if they're both running Linux. The debate over Raspberry Pi versus tiny PCs isn't as simple as some people think it is. Value is a complicated beast, and there are tons of great deals if you're willing to go used, or if you realize you don't even need all the power of a full Pi or mini PC, and you can just use an old computer that you already have collecting dust. But who am I kidding? Some people just want to feel validated in their own decision, and I get that. But it's hard to make a universal claim about what's the best value or gives the best performance for all makers, hobbyists, and home labbers. It depends a lot on what you actually do and your appetite for spending time managing your hardware versus just buying something and using it. Don't get too rowdy in the comments. And until next time, I'm Jeff Keerling.